good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Today, Harry and Meghan torch what little was left of their relationship with the royal family and what little was left, frankly, of their own reputations. Last week was mostly sycophantic. This latest instalment was downright seditious. Well, Harry and Meghan's Netflix series, released to the world this morning, is packed with... Well, not really revelations, are they? It's sort of rehashed old revelations with a new twist. As it turns out, we've apparently been wrong all along. Britain is a nasty, racist hellhole where only magnificent Meghan stood up to all this. And the world's biggest victims are not the people of Ukraine or the people battling COVID or people struggling in a devastating cost of living crisis. No, the world's biggest victims right now are the Duke and Duchess of Netflix. And don't take my word for it. This promise of once you're married, don't worry, it'll get better. Once they get used to you, it'll get better. It, of course, it'll get better. But truth be told, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how good I was, no matter what I did, they were still going to find a way to destroy me. Yeah, nobody set out to destroy you. Uh, you destroyed yourselves in this country with your ludicrous, hypocritical behaviour. The truth be told, what she just said is completely not a garbage. Harry and Meghan's romance, engagement and marriage were all greeted with ecstatic joy by the British media, the public and the royal family that they've all now abandoned. That's the truth. Not Harry and Meghan's truth, but the actual truth. The first three hours of this uh, Netflix series paint a very different, far uglier picture of this country and our royal family. Eight days after the relationship became public, I put out a statement calling out the racist undertones of articles and headlines that were written by the British press. And I wasn't thinking about how race played a part in any of this. I genuinely didn't think about it. Some of the members of the family was like, right, but my wife had to go through that. So why should your girlfriend be treated any differently? Why should you get special treatment? Why should she be protected? And I said, the difference here is the race element. I sometimes call the Commonwealth Empire 2.0 because that is what it is. There is a huge level of unconscious bias. The thing with unconscious bias is it's actually no one's fault. But once it's been pointed out or identified within yourself, you then need to make it right. Yep, we're all racist, apparently. Sounds like a different country, but let's be clear, Britain's one of the most tolerant and multicultural nations in the world. We celebrated the glamorous modern flair of the new young royals. We eulogised the newly biracial monarchy as the fresh face of 21st century Britain. I wrote newspaper columns about it myself, including on the day of the wedding. The press and public only turned on Harry and Meghan when their behaviour became obnoxious, self-serving and rankly hypocritical. Sadly, millions of people around the world will watch this series and they'll believe it. They'll believe the smears about Britain and our monarchy, that we're a bunch of bigoted and hateful people. They even blamed Brexit for the racism which apparently was aimed at Meghan Markle, which is just completely absurd. But by far the most sickening part of this show for me was the constant use of Harry's late mother, Princess Diana, to stoke sympathy for Meghan. So much of what Meghan is and how she is is so similar to my mum. She has the same compassion, she has the same empathy, she has the same confidence. She has this warmth about her. Who's that? I accept that there will be people around the world who fundamentally disagree with what I've done and how I've done it. But I knew that I had to do everything I could to protect my family. Hey, Grandma. Nothing says protecting a family like putting a kids in a reality TV series, does it? Having known both women, Princess Diana and Meghan Markle, I can say with absolute certainty they had nothing in common whatsoever. I couldn't think of two women more different. And when it comes to compassion and empathy, where's Meghan's been for her own father? She completely disowned him, as she did all her wedding, actually, before the wedding. As this series makes clear, he just suffered a stroke a few months ago. Miss Compassion hasn't even bothered to call her father to ask how he is. And the answer, as we'll find out tonight from his son Thomas, is he's not well at all. Harry's never even met the man whose daughter he married. Doesn't care. Mr Empathy, Mr Compassion. 
Yet this man, Thomas Markle, raised Meghan on his own for many years. That wasn't in the documentary. That was glossed over. That was ignored. Just like he is now. He lives 70 miles away from them. It's about an hour-long cab ride. Never seen his grand grandchildren. This show is packed with a kind of spurious claims and hypocrisy that have become the Sussex signature. We learned they began making videos about the heroic journey six months before their Netflix deal was even announced and right at the start of a pandemic that was killing thousands of people every day. Their only concern was their own situation. So we had to flee the country for family privacy, says Harry, as we watch a $100 million documentary in which he flaunts his young children and shares private text messages, intimate photographs for the entire world to see. When it comes to paparazzi, I had more paparazzi outside my house when I was forced to leave my old job for disbelieving Princess Pinocchio's lies than I saw actually outside their houses at any stage of this documentary. Maybe their mob scenes are to come. We haven't seen any so far. In fact, all their claims of paparazzi intrusion in the two trailers turned out to be nothing to do with them. They weren't even at many of the events which were depicted. So forgive me if I don't think this is all a load of BS. But frankly, the biggest problem with this series so far is that, like the Sussex themselves, is actually, it's dull, it's predictable, it's cliche-ridden, it's simperingly sycophantic. It's one long rendition of all their greatest whinges and a load of self-congratulatory nonsense. Harry and Meghan sold their royal souls to become reality TV stars, but they haven't got the charisma to carry their own sob story. They're now a grasping ex-royal version of the Kardashians, only with less class, less loyalty and less brains. Harry and Meghan, the dreariest couple in the history of planet Earth, famously abandoned their royal duties for a life of privacy. They left the goldfish bowl of Great Britain for the camouflage of California, remember? Famously sheltered from the evil British press. And since then, they've kept an incredibly low profile, as they vowed to. If you excuse the massive book deals, the Silicon Valley startups, the preaching videos about well-being, the podcasts, the speeches, and the major network interviews with everyone from Oprah Winfrey to James Corden. But they've barely been seen or heard at all, have they? Well, on Thursday, they'll quietly and apologetically release their $100 million documentary series on Netflix. I mean, nothing says protecting your family like doing a reality TV fly on the board documentary about every aspect of your family life for the delectation of the entire planet, does it, Harry? Well, a brain pack of paparazzi photographers jostling for space to hound the happy couple. That's what we just saw, right? Childhood photographs clearly intended to evoke the tragic death of his mother, Diana. But those photographers we just saw weren't actually interested in Prince Harry at all. They were at the premiere of a Harry Potter movie five years before Harry even met Meghan. There weren't any royals there at all. This apparently sneaky paparazzo lurking above the Sussexes was actually invited there to cover their meeting with Archbishop Tutu in Cape Town. Another photo used in the promotions shows Harry's outstretched hand apparently shielding the couple from photographers. Only, it's actually a cropped photo of Harry with ex-girlfriend Chelsea Davey, taken in 2007. And a press scrum shown dashing after the unhappy couple was actually chasing after reality TV star, one of their compatriots now, Katie Price, at Crawley Magistrates Court. Ironically, for a couple who've repeatedly sued newspapers for intrusion and inaccuracy, they've just put a lot of whoppers into their trailers. That's before we even get to the main event. When the stakes are this high, doesn't it make more sense to hear our story from us? Oh, shut up. What do, what do you mean the stakes are this high? Who do you think you are? Other than a latte-munching imbecile living in luxury in California while the rest of the world is a cost of living crisis, moaning and whining about an institution which gave you the titles on which you now trade millions of dollars. What are you talking about? What stakes are there other than the massive, gigantic stake you're currently plunging into our monarchy over here? And as for telling their story, sorry, have I missed something? I thought you've been telling your truth, which is often a pack of lies, from the moment you abandoned this country. Well, today's new trailer doubles down on the last trailer, and there's more tears. Remember that clip of Meghan once showing us how she could cry like that at the drop of a little tarnished tiara. Remember that? She could do it like that. Just bear that in mind when you watch it. <laughs> Did you get that one? And as for the shameful comparisons with Princess Diana, 
I remember Prince Harry being very, very angry about the media exploiting his mother for commercial gain. Yeah, what has he done with this Netflix series? He's used his mother to sell it. Could there be a more grotesque exploitation or a more hypocritical one than him using his dead mother's imagery to engender sympathy for himself again as the great victim in this world? I find it all puke-making. Uh, and I speak as someone who's actually in one of these things. I pop up. Yeah, me. Um, and to my astonishment, I was being very nice about Meghan Markle. Let's have a listen. It's really hard to look back on it now and go, what on earth happened? You hear that? That is the sound of hearts breaking all around the world. She's becoming a royal rock star. And then... Everything changed. There's a hierarchy of the family. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. It's about hatred. It's about race. It's a dirty game. The pain and suffering of women marrying into this institution, this feeding frenzy. I realized they're never going to protect you. I was terrified. I didn't want history to repeat itself. No one knows the full truth. We know the full truth. Oh, God, you wouldn't know the truth if it hit you around the back of your head. This gruesome twosome only survived by cashing in on what's left of their royal status now. I said it before, I'll say it again tonight. King Charles should strip them of all their remaining titles and cast them out from any connection to the royal family. How could any of them trust them as far as I could throw them? Because without it, they're just whining millennial windbags with a permanent victim complex, knowing that victimhood is what makes them all the money. The irony is earth-shattering, isn't it? Harry and Meghan are the Duke and Duchess of gaslighting themselves. The entire show is a cynical attempt to manipulate viewers into questioning their own recollections of reality. And if we learned anything at all from the first three hours of this $100 million whinathon, it's surely that this dismal duo wouldn't know the truth if it smacked them around their smug chops. Let's look at their truth versus the actual truth. Meghan moans that royal advisers forced her to uninvite her dear niece, Ashley, from the wedding, the only member of her family that she seemed to be still talking to. How do we explain that this half-sister isn't invited to the wedding, but that the half-sister's daughter is? And so, with Ashley, the guidance at the time was to not have her come to our wedding. <laughs> Yeah, that was a lie. Impeccably placed royal sources told the Sunday Times no such guidance was ever given. And that was supposed to be the show's big example of how Meghan really cares very deeply about her family, so deeply that only one member of that family was at the wedding, her mother, not even her favourite little niece, Ashley. Meghan also sees she got no advice on royal protocol, forcing her to learn how to be a princess all on her own. Joining this family, I knew that if there was a protocol for how things were done. There's no class in some person who goes sit like this, cross your legs like this, use this fork, don't do this, curtsy then, wear this kind of hat. The doesn't happen. Another lie. And by the way, Megan, if you don't like me calling you a liar, just sue me and we'll go through all this in court. The Sunday Times discovered she was actually handed a 30-point dossier, studiously researched, brimming with information and contacts. Meghan later simpers that she never wore bright colours to show respect, because she's all about respect. So I was like, well, what's a colour that they'll probably never wear? Camel, beige, white. So I wore a lot of muted tones, but it also was so I could just blend in. Like, I'm not trying to stand out here. No, the last thing Meghan Markle would ever want to do is stand out. But it's all another lie. Photos taken by the evil, bigoted British press show her wearing pretty much every colour in the rainbow. The show opens with the claim that the royal family declined to comment on the series. That's another lie. The palace says it received one email from an unknown company and attempts to verify it were flatly ignored. Even the story of their romance and engagement Turns out to be in a series of whoppers. They told the BBC in 2017 they were set up by a mutual friend on a blind date. They told Netflix they met on Instagram. And what about Harry's modest proposal in their humble cottage kitchen? 
Uh, it happened uh, a few weeks ago, mm. um, earlier this month, here at, at our cottage. Um, just a standard, typical it's night a for us. It's a cosy night. It was, what were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Roasting chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. And it was just, a, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet. An amazing surprise. It was so sweet. Well, according to Netflix, which is their show, it was actually a candlelit extravaganza in their walled garden. And Megan was so amazingly surprised, she managed to figure out what was happening and tell her friend about it before Harry even popped the question. A small little detail, but rather like their claim, or Meghan's claim, that they'd been secretly married by the Archbishop of Canterbury in their garden before, three days before, the big televised wedding, which also turned out not just to be untrue, but had it been true, would have led to the Archbishop of Canterbury being incarcerated in prison. As with all things Meghan and Harry, it would seem, the truth just doesn't really exist in their world. It's their truth, their version of it. Look at each other. Imam, Imam, well. yeah. look at the front pages there, which is when their engagement was announced. Yeah. Where's the racism? Do you remember, that was before she actually said that the institution was racist, and that's mm. my point, how institutionalised racism works. Is right. The minute but you do, dare, dare but say you accept, that the institution is sorry, racist, just, everyone Iman, piles stop on. Shouting. That's what happens, you accept, you accept there's no racism in those media pages? Because that was before she said that the institution no, was racist. Actually, after, what happened, after that actually, moment, that's what, when everyone decided to pile on. Actually, and what happened uh, is as a woman. people began to pile on when she started having half a million dollar baby showers in New York and flying back on the Clooney private plane. Which they started several, having a pile on. Points. Started Those having a pile points. on when they used Elton John's private plane like a taxi rank whilst preaching about carbon footprint. They had another pile on when they had other huge extravagant events they went to, and then when they're preaching about poverty on their Twitter account. Time and again they were caught being rankly hypocritical. That was why the media coverage began to turn. Then there was all the stuff with her father. Many people felt that she was unnecessarily cruel to her father. People have since criticised his own behaviour. I accept that. But certainly, to start with, they ditched him. They dropped him. Harry's never met his, his father-in-law in his life. You know, he proposed marriage to this girl knowing what's going to happen and then doesn't do anything to protect the father at all. And so now she's disowned him. What kind of people put compassion on their website, as they do, as being at the centre of their core being, when they live 70 miles away from this guy who has not got long for this world, he's in poor health, all he wants to do is meet his grandchildren and she won't have anything to do with him? That's not compassionate. And also the hypocrisy and the lies are not what I think are decent values in people. And I think Meghan Markle branding as a racist country and attacking the institution, the monarchy, is racist. It's unfair. I think, I think it's actually, unfair. I think she totally is. Unfair. She is what I would call a race baiter. If she doesn't produce hard evidence to support these incendiary claims, she becomes a race baiter, exploiting racism and the issue of racism to act as a kind of protective shield around her and to make herself extremely rich and famous as a professional victim. Mm -hmm. I've spent more time in Sussex than Meghan mm -hmm. and Harry yeah. have in the last two weeks. <laughs> so, actually, mm -hmm. a month. But um, they're never there, yeah. but they've got these titles which are given to them. That's really all I mean about they trade off Duke and Duchess of Sussex, the royals, to make themselves incredibly rich. And I, just, I do wonder if there's a point where Charles goes, actually, you can't do that anymore. It'd be unprecedented, but why wouldn't he? Yeah, but I think it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, no one really cares about the titles. Uh, if you strip them of the titles, they're still Harry and Meghan, they'd still be equally famous. And they'd still but they be... wouldn't be acting as members of the royal family. Yeah. I don't think they go around acting as members of the royal family. Oh, they no. do. Oh, all the paperwork, all the letter do. headings, yeah. it's all due from the office of the Duchess of Sussex, all this nonsense. She calls herself a princess on her podcast. Little girls have got to be like a real princess. You're not a princess. She's not a princess anyway. <laughs> Uh, but they, they do it quite deliberately to yeah. fuel the interest from commercial entities. And really, the interest is based on them trashing their family. I mean, without that, I'm not sure what we're interested in. We don't want to hear their woke homilies about life, do we? So I'm not sure how this all plays out, but it's a mess. And Charles may have to deal with it, I think. Well, good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Today, Harry and Meghan torch what little was left of their relationship with the royal family and what little was left, frankly, of their own reputations. Last week was mostly sycophantic. This latest instalment was downright seditious. Prince Harry mauls his own brother. He accuses his father, the new king, of being a liar. 
even as a dig at his late great-grandmother, the Queen, for standing by and doing nothing. The royal family is directly accused of destroying two of its own to protect itself. And I don't know where it all stops, all this. Where does it end? We've got the book, and then we've got the interview circuit, and it's so it goes on. It's all apparently a dark plot by Britain and the royals to smear the poor, defenceless, vulnerable Sussexes. Trickery, treachery, hypocrisy. And if there's one conclusion to draw from the final instalment of their Netflix series, it's that Prince Harry surely is now a traitor to the country that he once served.